This is Dog Talk with Michael J. Solar on BLK9 TV. Michael, dog trainer, author, and the owner of Blue Line Canine Dog Training, will bring you the answers you need making your life with your dog the best it could be. Now, here he is, Michael J. Solar with Dog Talk on BLK9 TV. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Dog Talk. I'm your host, Michael J. Solar. And like always, we start off every episode with a little bit of gratitude. So thank you guys for liking, loving, and sharing the show. If it wasn't for you, we would have no motivation whatsoever to go out there and do these things. But as we continue to go out there, making these shows, making awesome connections and relationships throughout the world in the pet industry, it's all because of you guys. So thank you all for continuing to watch the show, giving us a thumbs up and sharing it with your family because the night's episode, we are introducing you guys to Mr. Patrick Flynn of Patrick's Pet Care in Washington, D.C. Uh, as always, I had a little bit of a conversation to get the conversation started with him. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy tonight's episode as Pat has had his organization going with some amazing ideas and things. So without any further ado, let me bring you uh, Mr. Patrick Flynn. So, Pat, welcome to Dog Talk. Thank and you. Thank you. And we're going to go real quick through this so people can find some information if they're looking for information on you. It's at patrickspetcare.com, and you are located in Washington, D.C. Is that right? That's correct. Awesome. So, Pat, like we got to start this off a little bit. Most some of these listeners might not know who you are, and they will by the end of the episode because you I have to ask you what got you started in the pet care industry. And if I remember right, it's been over 10 years in your location, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, it'll be 10 years this coming March. Awesome. Um, I had, uh, like a lot of people, I had a desk job uh, that I didn't particularly care for, proposing to do your, do your job, doing your job, proving that you did your job under fluorescent lights in a cubicle. Uh, that was not really my jam. Um, and I decided that I was going to quit that job and then figure out what I was going to do next. And I didn't want to give up my evenings or my weekends. So I thought, what is it that I can do while I figure out what I'm going to do next um, to pay the bills. And I put up a name your own price advertisement on Craigslist. And um, by the end of the first summer, uh, offering to walk people's dogs for name your own price, I was in as many places as I could be at once. And then I decided there was a business there and it was time to hire people. Nice. Now you have decided to go down, you're located in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And what we've discovered in our previous conversation is that in down there in Washington, D.C., a lot of people don't uh, have automobiles. So it's, so transportation to your location is a little bit on a difficult side, right? So you've decided to create a pet taxi, but it, it, it didn't end there. Is that right? Where did you, where did you go with it? Yeah, I mean, I where I was able to open my first locations were in gentrifying areas because that's where I could afford the square footage. Uh, in or at the right price to be able to make it all work. Um, so I built in an opportunity to transport the animals from uh, wherever they were in the district to my locations. Um, and it turned into a very successful operation. Um, it allowed us to really build our reputation by taking the animals from where they were, from very busy people who um, didn't really have time or didn't have the means, literally did not have the cars, to get their dog from where they were to the services that they wanted, which was us. So um, we started providing the pet transportation. And uh, from there for a while, pre until the pandemic hit, um, we took dogs all over the place. Um, I drove dogs to Florida uh, and used to pick up dogs uh, and do overnights at Dulles Airport. So people would buy puppies in Europe. Then the puppies would do their layover at Dulles. We pick up the dogs in Pet Force One. That's where the name came from because we were going to the private jet port at Dulles, pick up the puppies, take them to the overnight boarding location, take them back in the morning, and then put them on the next plane to the West Coast. And uh, it was cool, pretty cool. Met some really interesting people. Pet Force One is the name of your transport, which I, I think was great. Then you were telling me earlier that due to popular demand of your clientele, the name got changed. Uh, so yep. why fill us in? What how how did what happened to that name? Where did it go? I was Pet Force One, and but people when they would call and ask for the service would call it Arf Force One, uh, Arf Arf Woof Woof, and I think <laughs> that is because it's a pun and spinoff of Air Force One. It's pres it's painted like the presidential plane, and um, we asked our customers whether they wanted you know whether they preferred a Pet Force One versus Arf Force One. 
And um, there's a little picture on the side of a dog uh, with its head out the window uh, saying, prepare for take ARF. Um, and uh, I think that's what won people over. And so we changed the name from Pet Force One to ARF Force One. I absolutely love that idea. As, we, as you heard, I had a little bit of a school bus myself. But I tell you, when I saw that on your website, I it literally melted my heart. I thought it was the the coolest idea ever to, to transport in uh, our force one. I think that's really, really cool. So that means you're giving these dogs the presidential treatment, which you really can't ask for anything more because I'm sure you agree with me that these dogs are more to us uh, than anything else, right? So we want to give them the first class treatment and we want our clients to know that they're getting that first class treatment. So tell us a little bit more about Patrick's Pet Care. Uh, so we're, you, you do transports, then you, I, I noticed that you do doggy daycare. So give us a little bit about your take on what and what makes Patrick's Pet Care doggy daycare different than every other doggy daycare that's out there. Yeah, so after I did that dog walking business, I decided I'd start a dog daycare because it just seemed natural that if you have a dog business and you start with dog walking, dog walking and dog daycare, how much different could it be? It's wildly different. Uh, <laughs> A dog walking is business is a very logistics oriented business, and you can and that takes a good amount of skill to do properly. But dog daycare is a totally different animal. I opened the dog daycare, and uh, I realized about two years in that, um, and I might get shot for saying this, but it's very easy for dog daycare uh, if it's not done right to be bad for dogs. Uh, and I didn't realize that, you know, if you don't have structured play groups, if you don't uh, distribute dogs by size, if you don't do thorough behavior assessments, uh, and if maybe if you, if you don't provide an opportunity for the dog to do what it wants. So some dogs like uh, to use an obstacle course while another dog might like to do set work. Um, okay. And until you provide the different opportunities for the dog, mm, it's really not, it's throwing dogs in a room, asking them to make friends and hoping for the best. Uh, and I don't really subscribe to that. I think it's bad for dogs. Uh, so instead of dog daycare, we do dog day school, uh, and I call it dog Montessori school. Uh, I grew what up is it? Dog what? Dog Montessori school. Montessori school. Okay. So I grew up um, in Massachusetts, and when I was a kid, there were these things called Montessori schools for children, which were largely ridiculed, um, but what they are, and they've since become widely accepted, but at the time, they were sort of like, what's a Montessori school? And it's uh, choice-based education. So if the instructor wants to, if the, if the learner wants to learn about shapes, the instructor needs to be prepared to teach about shapes. If the learner wants to learn about colors on a given day, the instructor has to be prepared to teach colors. So it's a big burden on the instructor, but it's really all cool for the learner. So rather than doing dog daycare, we do dog Montessori school. Um, and uh, it's meant to be a holistic experience for the dog where they have mental, physical, and emotional fulfillment with a whole lot of structured downtime and rest. I, that sounds absolutely amazing. I mean, just sitting here listening uh, to what you're putting together, I, I mean, wholeheartedly, I agree with you. I mean, when you think about doggy daycares, the goods, the bads, the lefts, the rights, right? I mean, think about our industry, right? Our industry is absolutely huge. We, we, we come together and everybody has their own twist. And this is what I think is the, the coolest thing about the show and the, the base that we have listening, watching, but more importantly is the people that are coming on the show to tell everybody about these different twists. So what you what it sounds like you create is a new twist on the norm, right? And I have to go ahead and say this, what would be some of the things that you might suggest the clientele? Obviously not everybody listening and watching the show tonight is gonna be in your area and they can't really come to you, but what would be some things that they can look for to see or maybe go to their doggy daycares and suggest uh, to, to bring more? What would you say is something that help them figure out if their dog is getting more enrichment than just playing in a group? Sure. Um, the most common misconceptions that I run into in our industry from customers in particular are the idea that a successful dog daycare experience means that their dog comes home exhausted. Um, and you know, they'll get social media pictures of the dog with its tongue hanging out on the couch and literally the dog is catatonic and unable to move for God knows how long. And to me, that means that the dog has gone too far and been pushed too far and hasn't had the structured downtime that it needs to be healthy. The dog is supposed to sleep 18 hours a day. So if you're already in a working environment where you're dropping the dog off from at eight, cause you got to go to work and you're picking the dog off at six. If it's awake that whole time, it's already exceeded its maximum amount of time that it needs to be awake for, for the day. 
Yeah. Um, so do, is there um, structured downtime? It's a huge thing to ask. The dog should, should come home, we like to say, satisfied rather than exhausted. So it should have its needs satisfied, but it should not be exhausted. So is there structured downtime? What does that structured downtime look like? Um, and what sort of enrichment activities are involved? And do they actually explore what that dog likes to do? Because just like people and dogs, there are many different dogs out there that get fulfillment um, from an enrichment from all sorts of different things. Um, yeah. And so you can actually, you know, most human beings, whether they know it or not, make 30,000 decisions, conscious and unconscious, every single day. How many choices does your dog get to make in a given day? It gets to eat when we tell it to eat. It goes on the walk when we want to go for the walk. It eats the kibble that we buy for it and say, eat this. If you go to a dog daycare and you say enrichment, you actually take an opportunity to have paid professionals with training look at, say, dog, what would you like to do? You want to do this or you want to do this? Do you want to do colors? Do you want to do shapes? Um, and then that leads to me to the third point um, is structured downtime. And then do they have enrichment and does it provide choice? And the third option is what is the level of uh, education and training and background that the people that are supposedly providing care, what do they know about dogs? And, and you know, how can they actually prove that? Yeah. Well, I mean, that one's definitely a difficult question uh, that come into it, right? Because our industry doesn't have that standard, which we did have a guest on previous episodes who you're familiar with, uh, with his, which is PAC, P-A-C-C, uh, which is the, oh, now I'm losing my mind on it. Certification, uh, yeah, it's, professional uh, animal it's certification, animal certification counts. Counts. Yes, PAC. Professional animal, yeah, I'll <laughs> pack everybody because I'm never going to be able to keep saying it all the time. So, it, and that sounds like a really good way to verifying people uh, that are they're taking courses in education. But sometimes not all the places are going to be very, you know, able to do that. As we were discussing earlier, we would like PAC to take the next step and certify locations, not just the people. So then that way, the, the it holds the entire location to the standard. So uh, I am one for that, uh, ladies and gentlemen of PAC. I'm just saying that you should certify locations. I have a, a feeling Pat agrees with me. So there's two for you to do it. And we should go from there because, I, you know, when you're certifying the locations, you know, I, and a weird way of saying this, you might agree, and we definitely would love to have a, an open discussion about this one. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are watching live, please feel free to throw comments in there and get into the conversation. Holding a company overall to a standard, right, is a great way of doing it. Sometimes you have to begin to get the employees in there as the beginning stage, right? So. What are some of the things like, you know, that you would look for at the overall of the company points, right? So I think like having that certification, but it's not out there yet, but obviously it's what I would look for. Uh, something that looks at with the trainers is testing the knowledge. That's one of my things that I like to do. I don't really like to ask for certification. I like to test the knowledge. I like to ask them certain things and see if they give me key what I like to say is uh, key clutch things, basically something like a Google, right? So if they give me the Google the answer, I'm probably not going to really trust them. I want the reality based. Can you can you explain it to me in three different ways, right? How, what are your thoughts on that one? When you're interviewing a, a potential person to take care of your animal, you, do you ask them just for the certifications or do you ask do you do a little knowledge test? Um, knowledge is important. I am big into uh, fulfilling people's potential and giving them opportunity for self-improvement. So I'm more interested in it, depending on what position they're being hired for. Yeah. But if we're talking about entry level and coming in and getting started, I'm more interested in the potential and whether they have uh, good judgment and they're smart. Uh, I don't particularly I'm care. asking if you were the client coming into mm -hmm. your facility. Oh, the client. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and we're going to say certifications are off. What is mm -hmm. some of the questions you might ask? You're the client. You're dropping your dog off. Mm -hmm. What could this client ask this staff to see that they're knowledgeable and they're going to provide a good enrichment to their dog while they're there? Uh, what's your policy uh, f uh, for medical or other emergencies? If something bad happened right now, uh, what, who would you call and what would you do? Um, what is, uh, you know, how, what, what's your webcam policy? Is, can I see my dog at any point in its experience at your facility at any time? Um, what uh, do you know? What are your stand? What are your cleaning protocols? What chemicals do you use? What do you do? You know the difference between sanitization, sanitizing, sterilizing, and disinfecting. Um, things like that. Um, there's all sorts of different uh, probing questions that I would ask. But if they know the difference between those three things, but again, if someone doesn't know that, it doesn't mean that the person right behind them in the doesn't office know, or yeah. doesn't know it. 
Um, so that's why I like the whole idea of a facility wide certification is because it actually tests, you know, who knows what and yeah. is there a, is there a family there that has the collective knowledge that you need to take care of good care of people's animals. Yeah, I mean, because I always say that when you work as a team, you know, one can be really good at one thing, one's a good at the other. And typically when you put them together, that's what gives you the whole pie, right? So I'm going to go with this one, right? So we are, as now the other service you have is training. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You do know, boarding too, right? So you do boarding. You do all the main four. You do grooming. Um, we do uh, fear-free grooming, force-free training, dog Montessori school, and enrichment walks. So enrichment. we had... We had an, an identity then transportation to service those things. We used to do dog boarding pre-pandemic, and then when that went down the tubes, um, I think that honestly, boarding is extremely hard to service to provide well from the customer perspective and the animal well-being. So I decided to stop doing it, and that, from a monetary perspective and a quality of care perspective and a staff happiness perspective, was probably the best decision I've ever made. We used to have a cat hotel too. That was wild. Yeah. So enrichment walks. Mm -hmm. uh, riddle me, man. What is what is an enrichment walk? Well, um, again, I go back to that uh, decisions that and choices that a dog gets to make in a given day. A lot of people, when they're choosing to subscribe to a dog walking service, are often you know they're busy people. Um, they're at work. They need they love their animal, but they would like to provide a little extra opportunity um, to go outside. And usually, it's all rotated and it's all surrounding going to the bathroom and giving the dog an opportunity to have relief. And usually those people unintentionally, it's not a bad thing on their part, but they right. often go on the same walk around the same block all the time, right? It's around their house. It's easy. They get up early. They got to go to work. They come home from work. They got to do the same thing. Um, and so we provide an enrichment opportunity to, again, take that dog and say, pup, what is it that interests you? Do you want to go to the park and on a long line and throw a softball? Do you want to go and do a, a, a scent or find it exercise um, in, a, in a field? Do you want to go swimming in Rock Creek Park? Do you, maybe, maybe you're having a chill day. Maybe you want to stay home in the apartment and after we take you out to do your basic business, maybe you want to get a massage. Um, what is it that provides enrichment fulfillment and that emotional, physical, mental fulfillment that that dog needs and take the dog walks to the next level? Dog walks still have a hugely important role in our society. It's just like for the people who want to do that next level of enrichment and fulfillment for the dog, that's what enrichment walks are for. I love it. I, I think it's a wonderful idea and a wonderful service to, to add into it. And then you have, so, all right, you, you said you have um, force-free grooming. Is that, that's what it was. Fear-free. Right? Fear-free certified Fear -free. grooming. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So grooming is not something I, I'm very familiar with at all. I, I'll mm -hmm. admit wholeheartedly. Uh, this year is the first year I really started to put in some knowledge into it and seeking information on that one mm -hmm. and it's been mind-blowing how much stuff i've been learning about grooming like and how detail oriented so much knowledge in that field mm -hmm. uh, one of which i can honestly say that i don't really think a whole lot of clientele is aware of i mean a lot of people don't even know what grooming is necessarily you know a lot of people oh it's clipping the dog's nails and it's you know almost where it's like that's where it ends and starts right or the new trend, or, or I should say the mediocre trend, that's still, for some reason, still around with the peanut butter on your forehead, uh, yeah. which I cannot believe somebody would actually do that. Mm -hmm. uh, that is mind-blowing. You should never, ever, 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 ever put saran wrap with peanut butter on your forehead to do that. Uh, it is the most dangerous thing you can possibly do. I don't care how much your dog loves you. Don't do that. Please, please, please don't do that. Um, but going into it, force-free grooming. All right. So I've had some, I had a couple of groomers on the show already and I've learned so many different things. One of which was with Jess O'Connor of Blue Nine Pet Products, uh, teaching us about how the dogs learn. You can learn, teach the dog how to rest their head in your hand. So that way they're allowed, they're able to do 10 times more grooming because the dog is now comfortable. Uh, they use the canine pet products of uh, the climb platforms to, mm -hmm. to help teach how to be on a grooming table, things like that. Is this something that you can expand on to getting people used to getting the dogs used to it? So using force-free grooming, I'm assuming there's a training program that's going to go along with that mm -hmm. to get the dogs very comfortable. I'm assuming. Could I, I guess what I'm trying to do is say, here's the microphone. Please elaborate on what is force-free grooming. Yep. And, and it, you've got the gist right. It's actually fear-free. There's force-free oh, training and fear-free fear grooming. It's, it's, but, you know, just in case people want to Google it, there's the yeah. fear-free certification. Fear-free fear grooming but, is a thing. It's trademarked. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. 
And um, if the best way that I explain it to people is they sort of imagine that when they're they're sending their dog to the groomer, they has sort of have this imagination that it's like going to the spa for humans. You know, a lot of groomers brand themselves as spas. There is nothing about a spa experience that is really that related to grooming at all. There are, there's dog massage, there is dog acupuncture, and that's a thing. But I much try and relate the experience of what a dog is going through with the groomer to the human experience of rather than going to the spa, it's much more like going to the dentist. So okay. when you go to a dentist, let the dog, the dentist will give you the choice of, you know, what kind of uh, a flavor of, uh, of uh, stuff they put on your teeth, you know, to make it yeah. uh, Fluoride, what, what flavor yes. fluoride do you want? Okay, that's a choice. Um, when you need a break, when you're stressed out, when you're having a lot of work done, you got a lot of plaque or whatever, you got the, the, the dentist will be, will be aware of your, of your emotional state and your sense of stress and be like, okay, you need a break. I'm going to let you sit up. I'm going to let you wash your mouth out. But it's got a lot of invasive stuff. It's got the thing that sucks your mouth, your, your, your sucks the stuff out. It's got the hooks. It's got the, 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 the uh, it's really, it's invasive. Yeah, right? yeah. It's I'm, truly I'm invasive. You. I mean, yeah, it's, and, it's the most uncomfortable position ever, ever in life that you can be in. Right. And, 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 but we've all been to the dentist experience. Maybe some of us have lucky enough to not been there, but you can have a dental experience where it's like you're gripping the sides of the chair and you're like, this is extremely unpleasant. And oh my God. Or you can be like, you know, I didn't get up on Saturday being excited to go to the dentist, but I got the work done. They were empathetic to my experience. They were compassionate. They were delicate and they did their job without causing me unnecessary pain. And like that is what grooming is and that's what grooming ought to be. So it's much more like fear-free dental work than going, you know, people develop yeah. terrifying fears of the dentist for a reason. I'm one of Same them. Same thing yeah, with I'm dogs. One. Yeah. I'm absolutely one of them. Absolutely one of them. And, and one of the funny things that I always wanted to do is put together a grooming class where you would essentially allow the dog to come weekly to build up um, the comfortability to the grooming, right? Mm -hmm. So that they would get on a grooming table. You would give them all the rewards. You would almost do fake haircuts and, and uh, do everything for the dog. So they, they just, you know, and I always believe dogs love the routine. They love going to the places of comfort. They love going to the places that make them feel good constantly. Right. So when you can create that habit and that safe zone for the dog, it makes things that would be normally dramatic, going to the vet, getting the grooming done. I mean, it, it's one of those things that sort of sucks sometimes in our industry, how we've almost become very robotic. Like just, it, it's gotta be done, it's gotta be done. Like, um, you know, what do they call it? A lot of times you work with groomers, they call it units instead of dogs. Mm -hmm. sort of. Software refers to the animals as units. Yes, how many yeah. units do we set aside for this dog? And that sort of bugs me a little bit, cause I'm like, it's not a unit. The dog is not a unit. It's a living, yeah. breathing creature with needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I guess you could say, well, well, it's it's what the computer says. It's what this says. I'm like, yeah, I'm not that guy. I, I just, I just bugs me a bit. You know, everybody should be handled with high levels of care. Everybody should be doing those things. Um, and yeah, I find that you're absolutely there's a huge education gap amongst most members of the general public and understanding of what goes into a humane, fear-free grooming experience is enormous amount of labor to do yeah. it right. And there's this disconnect of like, oh, I have a one o'clock appointment. I need my dog back by two. It goes back into this room that I don't know anything about. And then it comes back out. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no. Beautiful with diarrhea. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, diarrhea. That is not. And you have to educate people. And when you do educate people, because inform, you know, do inform the consumers. You take a minute. You don't preach at them. You don't lecture them. But you just give them a little bit of an opportunity to learn when you tell right. them why it's expensive and why it's going to take a little bit longer and that it's really good for their love member of their family they're like oh my god take my money please take it yeah you know yeah i was one of the things that i've been working on doing here uh at blue line canine is what i would love to do is um put together what I would like to, is the bathing class, bathing and nail trimming class, right? So we don't have any, we don't have any groomers uh, in our company, but we do have bathers. We have the bathing with the self wash. We have all that kind of stuff. And I always love to, to find out if clientele would be interested in paying for their dogs to learn how to take baths properly and get their nails groomed mm -hmm. commonly in these washes. And would they do it? And, and that's a big question I've always wondered in the industry is, you know, how many, how many pet parents are really interested in taking the time and teaching their dogs all these different things to get them so desensitized 
so that they have that comfort, that they don't have the stressful relationships. Um, as you were talking about with boarding, you know, a lot of times we put our dogs uh, through this stress, you know, and I always recommend that they they come to the facilities ahead of time to get the dogs through, you know, the doggy daycare style to get them used to the environment and that it's not that bad instead of dropping them off, right? Like, hey, I've never been here before, bye. And so the family that they love is now just drop them off and just disappeared for a week and then they come back, the family's excited. Of course, the dog's excited because the dog's like, well, I would have had fun, but I, I wasn't sure if you were coming back. You know, like, it's all about the teaching points, right? So I love how you're doing the fear feed grooming. I think that's a wonderful thing that you're putting together. So. I'm going to have to ask. So here's the big question. Ready? So in the fear feed grooming, what is some of the famous phrases that are overused by your clientele? Puppy cut. A puppy. Oh, my God. Give it the puppy cut. And it'll just be like, well, what in God's name does that mean? There's a complete and total disconnect between what they're imagining the words puppy cut means and what like, you know, it's just like, you know, it, it, there's just a very there's no set language um, about length uh, about understanding that you know people have a couple of different kind of hair types dogs have all kinds of different kind of fur types and there's only certain things that you can do with certain kinds of fur right? yeah um, so puppy cut is absolutely um, uh, overused um, other so what things, is a puppy cut exactly. That's exactly right. right. What is a puppy cut? I mean, so not, people, that, not like that's the number one requested thing. And then if you show you Google puppy cut, it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that is not the same as that. It's not the same as that. It's not the same as that. And so you have to have a very thoughtful, you ask people to bring pictures that they found on the internet. And then you really need to have a conversation because these people are asking you to trust them. And they have this imagination that is generally, you know, authentic. Like, I believe yeah. this is what I'm getting when I ask for this, but we don't understand what you see in your head. So a picture's worth a thousand words, bring a picture. Um, yeah, okay. And then, um, I think people don't understand in the grooming world, uh, they don't understand what de-shedding is at all, how it's done. They just don't, they just don't understand, um, you know, basic care and maintenance of their dogs. And speaking to your earlier point, Two people a week offer to pay me to teach them how to do better home care at their of their dog so that they don't have to come every week to pay a fortune to have us do it for them. So there's definitely a market out there. And, you know, um, maybe we should talk about that offline. But yeah, uh, there's a huge disconnect in terms of an understanding of what's involved in grooming. And there's a big industry. There's also a big, huge black lack of industry standardization there. But there's just a disconnect between uh, how people when you just think about it, when you go to your um, your uh, hairstyle, your hairstyle at Tyler's Barber, yeah, that's what I go to, yeah. You know, what number do you use to buzz on the side? What number do you use to buzz on the back? You know, do you want to have a part? Do you do whatever? And like the people who are coming to bring their dogs, you know, all we have is a head. You know, that's the only part of the body that the barber is ever touching. We hope, otherwise, yeah. you're arrested. <laughs> Uh, yeah. in, in a dog, there's all these all these different kinds of do different body parts that all need to be addressed individually and the humans don't know the language and how to talk about it. Yeah. It, well, that's definitely true. I mean, I don't know the language whatsoever. I'm in the industry. I barely understand language because it, like I said, you starting this year off, I've been learning so much about grooming, like why poodles get the haircuts that they get and how it protects their knees. It protects their kidneys. It protects. I literally thought it was just a, a foofy thing. Like I thought it was just, that was what you do to poodles because that was just what you do to poodles. And then, learning so much that, that their haircuts their styles are so historic and what the purpose of it is is absolutely amazing you know and thinking of groomers and how much they have to go through and learn mm -hmm. to put that together because you got to learn it and then there, there's new breeds of dogs that are coming out like a labradoodle i've seen labradoodles with the really curly hair and i've seen them with some mm -hmm. fine so mm -hmm. they got to probably learn or adjust on how to do that and then what haircuts do you get them I, mean, I guess that's where the puppy cut comes from where they're like i don't they, they don't know right. either so they just right and they, they've or they've googled labradoodle and you have they you have to very respectfully you know have the conversation about which genes and uh, related to the fur did your dog get did it get more of the lab or more of the poodle and depending on which which mix of the fur it's got there's certain things you can do with poodle fur that you can't do with lab fur and depending on where the spectrum they are 
you have to be like, yes, this is a picture of a Labradoodle, and, but your dog's fur will never look like that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little hard. Yeah, sorry, your dog straight has straight hair. Yeah, There's no just, way it's no, gonna be, no, be that. Can't early. do it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And then the the other one is shaving, right? So that's another mm -hmm. one that I see so often that bugs the ever living crap out of me. It really does. The, the 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 dog's coats are designed to control temperature for them. It it helps ricochet heat and, and keep them cool as well as ricochet cool and keep them warm and it helps them do that and for the life of me i've seen german shepherds shave down mm -hmm. and i'm like why <laughs> like have have you come across that in, at your facility where people are a lot of people come to you. us because their dogs have been shaved by other groomers and the reason that they come to us is i mean shaving is a tool that a groomer who's under pressure, right? They've got an appointment to keep and the dog comes in and like the easiest mechanism to get this, get start over again, basically is just shave the dog down and send it out the door. When oftentimes if you devote the time and have the right products and approach, you can humanely rehabilitate the dog's fur without causing it any great amount of discomfort at all uh, and actually get the dog's fur, you know, restored. Um, I've never seen a, sh a shaved German Shepherd, but I do get those requests all the time and people do come to us because, again, our industry, they're under pressure, they're appointment based, the customers don't have the expectation or the understand or the knowledge yet about, you know, a real groom might take of a, of a, of a Bernadoodle, I mean, my goodness, a Bernadoodle or um, a sheepdog, I mean, could take three and a half hours to do humanely. And if it's taking three and a half hours, would you want to sit in the grooming in the, in the salon chair for three and a half hours? No, you have to give them potty breaks. You have to get them time off the table. You have to give them a chance to rest because if you were in the dentist chair for three hours, so it takes a long time. And then you'd be like, well, that's going to be $300. And yeah. people are like, oh my God, well, that's what it takes. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah I, so are you a more of a fan of drop off grooming appointments versus like sitting and waiting? Um, all of our new customers, um, we, 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 it's, 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 that's a great question. Um, and it, as mm. it, everybody who's in the pet industry knows, it's hard to apply specific rules to an industry that's full of individuals that, you know, kind of depend, you know, like the dog in front of you today might be a little different from the dog. But uh, so for our drop offs, um, we say drop off between eight and nine and assume you'll pick up between four and six. If there's an emergency, your dog has some sort of issue that needs your attention, we will notify you immediately. Uh, or if we finish early, we'll let you know. But we want to take the time to get to know the dog and go at the dog's pace so that those stress-induced uh, reactions to, I'm in a new situation, I don't know what's going on, so I'm going to bite first and ask questions later, yeah. don't happen. So, right. But then once you get to know the dog, I'd be like, okay, we have a, we've established a rapport with this dog. We have trust with this dog. We understand what motivates this dog. Now that we have an understanding of what the customer wants for a haircut and what that looks like and we know what that looks like and what the dog – needs to go through and what we need to go through to get to that point, then we can start to do more specific. Okay. Then we can call it a unit, but until right. you get to know the dog and know the customer, no, no, we, we, I much err on the side of more time than less so that there's less stress, even if it's slightly inconveniences the humans. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally love the idea of just drop offs. Hey, I want a nail trim in a bath. Mm -hmm. Even that, I mean, it's a simple task, but just drop them off. That way, if they get on the table and they're just stressed out, they could be having a bad day. They can have these things. Mm -hmm nobody's inconvenienced because what always makes it worse in my opinion is when you have a client waiting in the lobby or in their mm -hmm. car and they're like, mm -hmm. uh, is he done it's yet? And, and then you're rushing it. And that to me is where it creates the, the additional stress, which accidental bites happen. And you don't really want that or the accidental, uh, more pressure, more holds, more things. It just, it's and nicks. I mean, if you're going quickly, you know, they've got the clippers. These are sharp, sharp pieces of equipment. Yeah. You don't want to be rushing. I'm with you. I just think I I love the idea of drop offs. I think it's a great idea, uh, in in those things, and that's what I would like to to see come out. Um, is is just drop offs? At least for me, at least that's just for the way I think it should be done. You know, you just drop them off, let the dog have its time, and, and you don't do units. You do dogs. Okay, like, right. hey, you can handle a few dogs if you rotate them throughout the day, giving them breaks, doing these things. You know, you can handle X amount of dogs, and that's how you do it. And if you Whatever it is, it is, and it just makes it flat rate, I guess, in, in my opinion, because it goes that way. Uh, anyway, that's just uh, you know the business, I guess, side of it of going through things. Um, so, what is the all right? Next question. Next question as we move forward. What is the best piece of advice ever given to you? 
from a client in you to help build your company the next level. Mm. It's a hard one, ain't it? <laughs> it's it's hard. Um, there have been several people uh, over the years. Um, I always try and make myself accessible. I always try and make myself if they push the right buttons in the phone tree or if they read in the fine print how to reach me, that if someone really has an experience that they feel like the owner needs to know about that I, I don't, I'm not some, I'm not hard to find. Um, yeah. And um, I would say that it's the fact that once you've got, once we had a little bit of a relationship established, scaling in any business is always difficult, right? But it's, make it easy for the people who love you to give you their money and like with 87 different clicks and and you know assuming you're doing all the basics right you got to you know care for the animals and do all that but if you the best advice was like listen patrick i love your business you are the best of the best your business takes better care of my dog than i've been to 87 other places and you guys do it but it's sometimes hard to make give you money because your platform is a little bit discombobulated and you have to click and do all these other things Make it easy for me to give you your money and you're going to have as much money as of mine as you want. So make it easy. Make it easy. Mm -hmm. And where do you think making it easy started? Was it with the clicks or was it with the care? Oh, 100% with the care. And to this day, I mean, there are still points where it's hard. Honestly, like I'm trying to make it better all the time, but there's still points at which the, our process could be easier, but we have a three-month waiting list because we've got the care down. And if you don't have the care down, then don't bother. Yeah. And the so people you, will pay for the care and the people will inconvenience themselves. They'll drive an hour if their loved one is well taken care of. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you wholeheartedly, a hundred percent wholeheartedly. That is something, you know, as we, we venture out there, we see all these different places and they're growing and they're, you know, I mean, with the COVID-19, right? So we had the, the, what I like to call the lockdown puppies, right? <laughs> so everybody yeah. out there is, has new dogs. They're, they're, they're exploring out there. Uh, where I'm seeing a lot of people starting to open up uh, places, uh, you know, in their apartments uh, for doggy daycare, and it was just mind blowing how they're doing this kind of stuff. But it, it it is what it is, right? And to me, I look at the dogs, and I was looking at giving them the top notch care, and it sounds like you have mastered the ability to provide them. You have the transport, you have the grooming, uh, fear. I got it right, fear free grooming, right? I finally got it right there. And then you have force-free training. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I see. I knew it was all, all going to come back to me full circle here. All right. And then from there, you, you, you're you educating with the enrichment for your your style of doggy daycare. And then you also have the enrichment walks. And it sounds like you really put all the, the keys in the right place or the pieces in the puzzle to create a phenomenal business that if people are listening or watching right now, they can check it out at patrickspetcare.com. It's a really neat thing to, to look at some of the ideas this man has had. I know you got, you personally got me impressed when I saw our, our force one. Uh, I think that was really one of those things that I just knew you had the creative mindset uh, to bring in the high quality training into the industry to these people that are, have their loved ones and they want to know what they can do more with their dog. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is, is we look about it as education. So what are some of the things that you're curious about currently? Um, I mean, our industry is so full of people who think that they know what they're talking about. And in some cases they absolutely do. Um, and that part of the reason that when I was redoing the background of this program is the fact that you talk about relationships and you talk about conversations and it's, through these mediums like this, where we actually get to know a lot of people call themselves experts that I don't wouldn't trust with. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, and um, I am really interested in like actually under like I want more science and more peer reviewed research to go into like what actually are the developmental periods of puppies and you know uh, what are the implications of sending a dog like, I believe that dogs absolutely have personality types, play styles, uh, and psych com much more complicated psychology than a lot of people give them credit for. Mm -hmm. And like, not all dogs need to go to dog daycare. And like, how is it? I think we have a great system, but it's borrowed from a lot of different things that are do that are do a lot of credit for right. me basically stealing their stuff. Um, but swiping. to make my own system, Just swiping, swiping. Whatever. Yeah. Um, and like, I want to know, I want more peer reviewed science uh, about 
the pet industry in general so we can actually get to some actually quantifiable research about this is what's good for dogs, this is the emotions that dogs have, this is um, the the breed traits, you know, like, you know, it, it, our, our, there are really, really big questions out there. Are pit bulls uh, naturally dis in, predisposed to be nasty? I mean, the pit bull I mean, the um, right there. Mm -hmm. But the hell out of me. Because yes. We were originally bred for being nannies. Yes. No, no, no. I'm just I saying that, like, Oh no, I know. I'm just, I had to clarify that one for anybody listening is that that is just something that uh, always bugged me when people bring that up. Cause I'm always like, Arr! it's like all sorts of crazy things out there. And I want yeah. science. I want more science to actually say, what is our, what, what, who says that this is true? Like who, right. and like, who are they? As opposed to, I have a YouTube channel or I have whatever, and I've discovered whatever, and this is true. And then yeah. it gets, it gets parroted. And then all of a sudden it's out there and it's like, Oh my God, no, this is actually not true at all. Yeah, it bugs me too, man. I'm with you. I think this is, I love the fact you brought this up because I think it's a good way to just, we have to, you know, fast 20 minutes where we can keep BSing on it. I think it's great. I love the fact that you bring up the science because I love the science. Matter of fact, any client has ever probably talked to me has probably heard me quote either Pavlovian theories, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Skinner, uh, mm -hmm. Clever Hans. I mean, it, it, it's when people, it, like, this is no joke. It bugs the hell out of me how people have no idea where the science is, but they'll call themselves experts. It's crazy to me. Like they're like, oh, we do clicker training or I'm science-based. But then if you ask them a simple question is what is your science? Mm -hmm. They have no idea, right? Or Pavlov, when they just tell me it's a bell. Mm -hmm. Mine, like like how, how do you bre break something down, that theory, right? That's huge. I mean, the theory, the classical conditioning theory is, I forgot how many pages. It was, I think it was like over 100 something plus pages. The theories break down. Mm -hmm. How do you simplify it with just a bell? <laughs> like it's just. It helps people memorize, you know, it like gives, like, you know, it, I understand why. I mean, that's basic. I, I mean, if I sure, truly, sure. if I were to explain to someone on the street who's like, who's Pavlov, I would be like, well, he had this guy and he figured out that if you ring a bell, then the dogs, at the same time that they're learning to. Yeah eat and then bring the bell later, they still salivate because they remember that the bell was associated with them about to eat. Like, and then breaking that down to someone who's never heard it is like, oh, okay, I can kind of get that. Yeah, um, I'll give you one to throw you for you, ready? I'll, I, I've always wanted to have this conversation with somebody that's gonna go with me on this one, ready? What is the definition of positive? Uh, I think that's a great question and I think the answer depends on the perspective of the learner. This guy's genius. Yeah, I love it. Love it. I love having that conversation with people because when people tell me what positive is, it blows my mind because it, you literally brought up telling me how the dogs are different. Mm -hmm. And I wholeheartedly yeah. agree with you. Every person mm -hmm. I've ever met has a different drive, different personality, mm -hmm. different thing, right? So people are different. Dogs are different. That's why they get along with different people. Like not, you can be the greatest dog person in the world, but you're not going to get along with every dog because they might not right. like you. They just don't like you. And that's acceptable. And they might love the families. But then when you get into the word positive and you're like, I give the dog a treat, that means positive reinforcement. But what happens if your dog doesn't want food? What yeah, what makes that dog? Right. And yeah. then there's like for dogs, some dogs who were there to help, our very presence is aversive. And it's not possible to be purely positive if you're in the presence of a dog with whom you are genuinely trying to help, but your very presence is aversive. So therefore, by your presence being aversive, you can't possibly call yourself purely positive, right? <laughs> so like, you know, be as, I try and be as positive as I possibly can, and I avoid things that I consider that based on the eyes and ears and training and knowledge that I have, if I perceive the learner finds it to be aversive, knowing that the learner can't talk, but that I can observe language, body language, I'm going to try and not do that. But yeah, I, 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 you know, I always say when you, when you get a hold of the dog, you know, you do evaluations or consults and the first time, the first time you're ever with the dog, you got to meet the dog for the dog. You got to find out what drives them, what makes them want to click, what makes them want to work. Sit down, come stay is not basic obedience. They're cues, they're, they're, they're actions. They're nothing more than uh, a, a trained behavior. They're nothing more than that. At the end of the day, the, the dog is giving you something for something. Mm -hmm. 
It's an equal exchange. There's an exchange. You want me to sit, what's in it for me? But the question is, what is in it for him, right? Or her, right? So does he want to be petted? Does he want to play ball? Does he want to find something? Does he want to just hang out with you? What happens the dog just loves watching television? Mm -hmm. And there are those dogs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, you ever see like the videos where the dogs watch television with their owners and they get really like, into the shows? I've never had a dog like that. <laughs> never had a dog. That, like I can put a show on with like deer and everything in the world running through the screen and my dog will not give a care whatsoever about what's on television. Yeah. I mean, it could also, you know, it depends on what colors are on the screen, what colors they can see yeah. and, you know, but yeah. Yeah, never had that like that. My canine used to get pissed off at me when I would not wear my police uniform. So when I was in law enforcement, I was a police officer. You know, I had multiple dogs, and I did, trained dogs off duty, worked on duty as canine handler. If I wore certain outfits, certain dogs would get excited hmm. because they knew those outfits belonged to their time, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And, and this is what I always try to explain: is that you know, we as owners, we don't even realize how habitual we are like and that and how our dogs are studying us 24 hours constantly a day. learning constantly processing constantly, constantly taking in their world yep mm -hmm. they're figuring constantly it out. understanding cause and effect cause and effect yeah they're like oh mom dad grabbed the car keys they're leaving i'm home alone right yep. uh one argument i got into one time is uh you know hey, i say crate training is a really good way of controlling your dog keeping the rules and boundaries uh positive things all these things we're going into crate training right mm -hmm. they said they don't want the crate to be a negative place so they don't put the dog in there for timeout I said okay well how do you explain to me how you use it? Well, every time I leave the house, I put the dog in a crate and I give him a treat. So it's positive. I said, so your dog loves you, wants to be with you, and you put the dog in a crate with a treat. How does the crate remind them of a positive thing if you're leaving? Yes, you said a lot of that really fast. And I sorry, need to look sorry, at it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that is, but, a, yeah. that is a very common debate about how do I not make the how do I not make the crate a negative place? And, and I, there was lots of things that could be the reward there. And you said it really quickly, but yeah, I'll give you the there could have been a million, right? So <laughs> you have the dog that goes in the crate. So I'll slow it down. Dog goes in the crate every time I leave the house. That's the number one rule. So what okay. I do is I give the dog a treat in the crate to show that it's not a negative place. But okay. when I'm home, the dog is not required whatsoever to go in a crate, which mm -hmm. means the crate is only used when I leave. Mm -hmm. How does the crate remain? A positive place because now my dog after a few months of doing this is now guess what they're not doing they're not going in the crate anymore because the dog doesn't really care about the treat it cares about me yeah i would say it really de it depends on that again that particular dog and what you, the up. treat that you gave it so like it could be that it's the type of dog that when you give it whatever it is like the martians could invade and it wouldn't notice and it's really excited about going in the crate doesn't even care that you leave and then there could be other dogs that you put in there with the crate or you give it the little piece of kibble and it eats it or doesn't doesn't eat it at all and you leave and it is associated with a negative consequence. It just depends on what the perspective of that learner is. Man, this conversation is going fantastic. I love talking to you right now because you're pointing out the fact that every dog is different and the systems and abilities and the training techniques have to adjust to the dog and the clientele, right? So. It's the dog, it's the clientele, it's the it's the factors of there's many different factors. There's not just one way. So you can't sit there and be, this is the only way, this is the only way, right? As uh, now I'm saying it like that, I feel like I'm talking about the Mandalorian, this is the way. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's so diverse and I love, that's why I think I love dog training. I get to meet so many amazing people, I get to work with so many amazing dogs and I get to work with so many different points. And when we talk about the science and we talk about the educational point, like, like I've always had a thing. So when we we decided to open up uh, boarding and things like that, uh, one of the big things for me was I don't think the dog should be left in kennels. Mm -hmm. I believe that the dog needs to be enriched throughout the day and evening, so that way not only are they their minds not just on the lonely factor, but they're they're out doing different things. They're they're being mentally physically stimulated. They're finding high levels of reward. So that way when mom and dad come back, they're still excited to see mom and dad, but they're also not like where have you been? You abandoned me. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's one of the big things for me that's always been out there. And, you know, I would love to figure out a way to get all the other facilities out there into the same level because so I'm with you. I think there there should be more studies to prove that the dogs are less stressed and those things. But again, in the industry, like we eliminated a lot of kennels here at my facility and, and apparently you you got rid of yours completely. For that exact reason. It's just exactly. you know, institutionalized care is really hard. And when you have a certain amount of staff you know, and like you're running the building 
24 hours a day, 365. Yeah. It wears on the people. It wears on the building. I mean, it was impossible to do just basic maintenance. Forget, but forget about that. I mean, that's like a benefit that I can do the maintenance now at night. But yeah. the but the but the quality of care for the animals when you have the same person, you know, 12 hour shifts, and it's it, the dog is, you know, in an institutional setting, 24 hours a day for a week while someone's on vacation. The quality of care that you have to output to have that dog not suffer from being in an institutional setting in some way is very high. Yeah, it's definitely work. Uh, you know, we I, I'm, I'm blessed with some amazing staff. I mean, they really are amazing. They go above and beyond with them. And that's one of the things that, you know, I commend you for for taking the maneuvers that you've done. Because, you know, for us, we uh, I will be honest and tell you that I felt bad when we minimized kennels. When we eliminated kennels and lowered our numbers and you get clients literally getting mad at you because you're full <laughs> and you're like i'm very sorry that we aren't able to get you in tonight because we had clients book a month in advance two months in advance i'm very very sorry but i'm not going to throw your dog in a crate and let him sit in a box like i'm just not going to do it i believe that every dog that comes in needs to be enriched and in order to provide as you say that level of care you you have to take care of your staff as well right you, you can't just it's it's a, it's all that all those points right and now it's it's we're finding it to be difficult so as other facilities as you're seeing come out with them you know it seems like you are on you and i are on the same boat with with providing enrichment now you also say you do scent work um with it yes you get do you is it the akc scent work is it just hide and seek with some food what do you where are you with that and do you provide your clientele i guess the ability to take it like are you uh, uh, hold on let me time it. Let me rephrase my question. Sorry, I got ahead of my own self. You're doing scent work with your dogs that are coming in for enrichment. Are you doing it to the standard of the current sport? Oh, or no. you it, okay. So you're just doing it. To no, no. We're not. We're like, here's some hot. Here's here's the here's the here's a it, it, there's like the baseline. You know, this it's more like you know, find it. It's the baseline. There's the hot dog under three cups. Find the hot dog under one of the cups. That's where like the baseline. Can you can you can you figure it out? And gotcha. then there's Here's here's a hot dog. Here's a piece of cheese, and here's a, a, some sort of toy. Now I want you to go and find this specific. Now that you know what these three things are, I want you to go and find the cheese, not the hot dog. Um, okay. And that's a, that is as, as sophisticated as it gets in a dog daycare environment. There is no more. It's, def, it's definitely not nose work to that to that. Okay, because when you said scent work, I'm thinking in my head going, it's not nose work. It's just. Okay. Gotcha. It's, so you're it's not really good for a dog daycare, but it's not that. Got it. Got it. All right. Because that was one of those ones where I'm like, I always, you know, we have a lot of clients that comes to us and I'm always like, you know, I have to refer them out. We don't do the scent work. Uh, I do seminars. I do troubleshooting with it, but I don't do scent work. Nose work, uh, the sport, it's very detail warning. You have to put the time into it, right? So that's why when you said it earlier, I was just curious. It was like, are you doing their practice for them? And setting up like you know, putting out birch and under the water and all that kind of stuff. No, no. It's okay. getting the old factory system working. It's getting the seek system going. Yeah. Getting that mental fulfillment so that they're physical tired and mental. Sorry, physically satisfied and mentally satisfied. Yeah. Brain, got it. brain tired and body tired. Yes, I like the word satisfied. I say stimulated, but you say satisfied. I, I like that word. I might have to swipe that from you. The satisfied. I like that. One. I'm sure I stole it from someone. I don't know where <laughs> I read it. That's it. That's it, man. So, Pat, listen, I had a true honor and pleasure having you on our show tonight. I really did enjoy this time. Ladies and gentlemen, if you guys are interested, you're in the you're, – uh, you're right now, you're only in the Washington, D.C. area. Are you spreading yep. it yet? Yep. Just in the D.C. area. If you guys are in the D.C. area, please feel free to stop by his place, patrickspetcare.com. You can also check him out on Facebook, Instagram. Are you on YouTube as well? YouTube, Twitter, YouTube. all of them. Everything. He's on every every social media platform you can get out there. Patrick's Pet Care. Check him out. Give him a thumbs up. Give him a like. Give him a share. See what he's got going on there. He's got some amazing ideas. I truly, truly enjoyed our conversation, Pat. Uh, and I look forward to staying in contact with you and, and growing our relationship. So thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you tomorrow for Stuck in the Truck and next week for another episode of Dog Talk. Thanks, everybody.